Hey, this last Sunday, uh, as we're moving through our study in the letter to the Corinthian church, we addressed uh, various promiscuous practices among uh, the Corinthians, which had um, bled into the church. And uh, one of those practices that Paul lists is uh, homosexuality. And I said in our sermon question video this week, we're going to do a bit deeper dive uh, on what Paul meant um, by that term and a lot of the debate that surrounds uh, that, that term today, uh, even in Christian circles. Um, the debate over the last 30 years, and as I said in, a, in the sermon, it's really only been in the last 30 years. Before that point, the church was 100% unified in its understanding of what Paul meant when he used the term homosexuality. But since um, gay relationships have become much more celebrated uh, in wider culture, it has caused some Christians to go back and, and rethink uh, the historic teachings of the church. Um, and if those are actually correct. Um, and so I'm going to go through uh, a couple of the bigger debates that you may hear um, and how we know, really, that the historic understanding is the correct understanding. Um, so first, one of, the, one of the first things that uh, you may hear is uh, when Paul uses this term either here in 1 Corinthians 6 or over in uh, 1 Timothy 1, uh, it's, we don't know what he meant. Uh, Paul made up this word, so who knows what he was trying to say. So we can't really be definitive about prohibiting anything because it's a made-up word. And we can't uh, have any confidence of what he means. Well, um, it's partially true that it's a made-up word. Um, and Paul actually does this from time to time. He uses a word um, in a new context that it has never been used before, um, or he, you know, puts two words together uh, as one word, um, you know, and, and we do this kind of thing today, right? People will, will turn nouns into verbs. I heard someone say the other day that they were mathing, um, as if, they're, you know, they're doing math right now, so they are mathing. They took a they took a noun and made it a verb. Uh, but when someone d does that, it's not like we don't know what they mean. Um, of course we know what they mean. Even though it's a brand new word to us, mathing, uh, we could decipher the meaning uh, without any difficulty at all. And so Paul here, um, he's, he, he, did, he did make up a word. It is true that he made up a word. But what he did was he took two already existing words and smashed them together. Um, he, he pulls them from the Old Testament, um, Leviticus 18 and Levit Le Leviticus 20, where it says, uh, where it forbids uh, men to lie with a man as they do with a woman. Um, and so the two words are kind of like man, liar. Uh, and in, in Leviticus 20, actually, those, those two words are right next to each other. Um, so Paul, smushing them together, he's just taking them from, uh, you know, the scriptures that he would have been very familiar with, takes those two words and makes them one word. In Leviticus 18, they're a couple of words away from each other, but it's, you know, uh, men sleeping with men. Those are, that's the, that's the two words that are smushed together. Um, and so that's not, that's not any mystery uh, of what he is talking about. <coughs> um, uh, we're confident what he means, right? Um, now, for those uh, of you who are maybe more astute, you would say P Paul's letter to the Corinthians was written in Greek and the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, so how could he take two words from the Old Testament, smush them together, and it be a different language and we know what they mean? Um, well, there was a Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septu Septuagint, Septuagint, I'm sorry, um, we only do one take on these videos, so it, you get what you get. Uh, so it's the Greek version of the Old Testament. We know Paul had it because of how he quotes uh, other things from that version of the Bible, and so he's pulling, he's pulling from that version, smushing these two words together. Again, not any mystery what he means there when he says 
uh, men who sleep with men, right? Um, the next um, <clears throat> uh, question that you might hear people ask uh, if Paul actually, if you know, if we actually have the right understanding of what Paul is saying there, um, is they're like, yes, Paul f- um, forbid um, um, certain homosexual practices, but it was only as it associated with like idol worship, um, you know, temple prostitutes. That's what he was condemning. Um, and, and the reason we know that that uh, is not true um, is because, uh, well, for, for one thing, maybe the most obvious that you can look at yourself is Romans, Romans 1, uh, verses 26 and 27, was talking about um, both men having relationships with men and women having these romantic, lustful relationships uh, with other women. Um, and what we know is, yes, there were, there were men who engaged in temple prostitution, especially with like young boys. Uh, that was very common. But, but there's, there's women did not do that with women in the context of temple worship. Um, there's not evidence from that in history. And so because there in Romans 1, where Paul addresses both men and women, we know it's broader than just this uh, idol worship um, practice. It would certainly include that. That's not okay either. But it's really um, pursuing a homosexual relationship in, in any way uh, is, is what he's talking about. Um, the last thing or another thing you might hear people say, is, the last one we'll cover today is... Um, uh, Yes, they had, you know, uh, one night stands with each other back then, uh, but there wasn't these um, ongoing committed relationships and especially not marriage. And if they had ongoing committed relationships, then um, then that would have been okay then. And especially if they had marriage then, then that would have been okay. Um, and uh, the first thing to say is they did have relationships back then all throughout the history of the world. I mean, there's much speculation about various famous figures really from every culture that has ever existed that, you know, they probably had a family over here, but their real relationship was with someone of the same sex over here. Um, And so that's actually very common throughout all of world history. These kinds of relationships were known about um, and not, it, they didn't just spring into existence here in the 20th century, for example. Um, they've really always been around. Um, as far as marriage goes, yes, of course, they didn't have uh, gay marriage um, in, in antiquity. Um, <clears throat> but, but, but their idea of marriage, which, I'm, which, which is deficient for sure, but their idea of marriage was, was all about having a family. I mean, the reason you got married was to preserve your family line, to have descendants, you know, to, to pass along your, your land, uh, you know, preserve your family name, um, you know, ex- ex- expand the number of your ancestors. That was the, that was the entire point of marriage. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't for love, personal gratification, although sometimes those things happened. It was really uh, for the establishment of family. Uh, and so... So, so, of course, if that's what you think marriage is, then you, you're not, you, you won't have homosexual marriage because you, uh, you can't have a family that way, um, especially in antiquity, um, wasn't going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so to say, you know, if they had marriage, then they would have been okay with it. It's really like saying if they had thought completely differently, then they would have thought completely differently. Um, but the, the prohibitions are, uh, are, are clear. Um, it's for, for really um, any type of gay relationship or, per, or pursuing those or fantasizing about those, um, dreaming about those, all, all of that is going to be outside of um, God's design from what he wants. Um, and, I, you know, positively, the way the Bible speaks about marriage um, is it's, it's one man and one woman. It goes all the way back 
to the garden, to Genesis 2. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Uh, That is the design for marriage. The two shall become one flesh, which involves, you know, the sexual union, but it's actually the union of your lives in every way. And it's a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. It's wording it positively. That is the biblical position. Jesus actually repeats this, right? Matthew 19, for instance, Jesus quotes back to the garden. So sometimes people will say, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. Well, he talked about what marriage and sexual union is meant to be in a positive way, um, not a not the uh, negative prohibition, but the positive affirmation is how he talked about it. And it's one man and one woman. Um, to which some people will say, well, there's lots of other kinds of marriages in the Bible. Polygamy is all over the place, you know. So it's not always one man and one, one, one woman in biblical marriage. And I would say, yeah, y- yes, you see polygamy in the Bible, but you also see murder in the Bible. Uh, that doesn't mean that murder is okay just because somebody did it in the Bible. Um, and actually, when you any time these accounts of polygamy in the Old Testament, these you know uh, kings who had all these multiple sons, you kind of see the chaos ensue from polygamy. Um, so you read that story, and you're supposed to get the idea of like, oh wow, this is bad. This is a bad idea. Um, and in fact, God. Um, uh, forbid kings from having multiple wives and then they went ahead and did it anyway. That doesn't, I mean, just because they did it doesn't mean it's okay, right? Going back to the garden, which is what, which is what Jesus does when they ask him about divorce. He goes back to, guys, the original good design is um, a man and a woman uh, to be united. And anything other than that, you know, original good design is what is out of bounds, um, from from God's good, uh, from God, from God's plan, from what He wants for us, from for His best for us. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean you know we made reference to this last time that everybody needs to be married or you're somehow um, lacking in life if you're if you're not married. Jesus was single. Paul was single. Um, Paul. We'll talk more about this week coming up. That Christians have a very high view of singleness. You can lead lead a totally full and complete life as a single. Um, it's even preferred, it seems to be, in 1 Corinthians 7 to marriage. Um, uh, but if we are in a relationship, in a romantic sexual marriage relationship with another person, it's with one person um, of the opposite sex. That is consistent throughout the whole Bible. Um, and as, but I, you know, we always want to put and all, and whenever we talk about a subject like this, we always need to say um, that I, that doesn't mean if if somebody's not matching up to the biblical design, we love that person, we don't hate that person, you know, we don't shun that person, we invest into their lives, we care about them, um, we certainly stand against any kind of hate of anybody. Uh, we would never want to see that. That is very out of bounds from God, what God wants for us, right? We support, we encourage, we go the extra mile, we bend over backwards, we sacrifice ourselves for their benefit, um, even if they're totally wrong, because that's what Jesus did for us, right? While we were still sinners, he died for us. And we, didn't, he, we didn't get our act together before Jesus totally poured himself out for us. And so we, we don't force people to get their act together before we totally pour ourselves out for them, right? Um, that, that is the Christian way, okay? Um, so we hope that's helpful. Uh, there's, there's always more that can be said, and you might have heard other arguments, and if so, feel free to send them in, and um, we'll try to address them. We'll see you next time.